All right, welcome back. This is Patents 1, Part 3. And we're in the textbook at pages 650 to 667. Uh, you'll see that I again left the stuff from the first capsule on the, on the board here. So the stuff that we saw in the first capsule, right? At first, the various requirements for someone to get a patent. I left them there because we're still working from that conceptual framework. So if we recap, right? What do you need to get a patent, right? First, you need patentable subject matter. You need something that the act, the Patents Act said, says is something that you can get a patent on. And what is that? It's an invention. What's an invention? An invention is defined in section two of the act. And basically says, right, lists a bunch of things that are inventions and then states the, the other requirements that we're going to look at. What do you need beyond patentable subject matter? Well, we saw there's basically three big characteristics that you need on top of that. And that is your invention, once you've established that it's an invention, has to be novel, right? Has to be new, has to be you know, something you invented, unlike, as we said, other areas of the law that don't require something to be new. Has to be useful. Has to be something, as I said um, in a previous capsule, that is commercially useful, something that people buy because they need it, and therefore they're willing to give you their money for it, and it has to be non-obvious. And what does non-obvious mean, right? As we said, it incorporates the standard of the postita. So what is non-obvious? Non-obvious is, right, a person should not be able to have come up with it on their own. Not with the plan, just in their living room on their own. If they can just come up with it, right, it's obvious. If it's obvious, it's not something that you can get a patent on. And as we said, it's kind of related to the earlier characteristic of novelty. If it's obvious, right, if everyone, you know, can think of it within 10 minutes by sitting on their couch, then by virtue of that, it's not novel. It's not something new that you invented. It's really something that anyone could have thought about pretty quickly. And as I said, right, I said a person cannot have thought of it, cannot have been able to think of it, on their couch, on their own, without the plan. And who's that person, right? As we said, it's not just some person walking down the street. It's a posita. It's a person ordinarily skilled in the art. Person ordinarily skilled in the art. And what is that? It's an expert, but a generic expert, as we said. Someone that is an expert in whatever you've invented, but not specifically on that, a, a bit of a more generic expert. And that's the standard, that's the person that we use to determine whether something was obvious or not. So these are the characteristics to get a patent. Has to be patentable subject matter, and has to meet the three characteristics that I've just said. There's actually a fourth one that we're gonna see that I don't think is really an additional characteristic, but that we'll put there just to be sure. Right, on top of that, right, it has to be not within the exclusion, right? So, we'll, we'll make sure to call it, um, we'll be careful because usually it's called, um, it's called a, a business method, but I'm going to be careful with the language here because um, because the law, um, the law changed, um, so we won't use the words business method. Well, let's say just, you know, we'll use the words theorem or ideas. Okay, and we'll see what that means actually next week. So we looked at what subject matter is this week. We look at, you know, what does it mean? means an invention. What's an invention? We look at the various ways that something can be an invention. So you have to meet that. You have to meet the three characteristics. And the book says it's separate. I don't think it's separate. It has to be not within the exclusion that's enunciated in, I think, Section 27 of the Act, 
which says it cannot be basically a mathematical formula or an abstract theorem. There's 25 ways to say it, but it's the same thing really. It, it cannot be an idea that is too abstract. And we'll see it applied. Hopefully it's going to become a little bit clearer. But essentially, right, you can't get a patent on an idea that is too broad, like a mathematical formula, right, that doesn't have an immediate application. Once you have an immediate application, once it is used for the specific purpose of making something or of using something that we already know about in a way that is new, that is special, then you can get a patent. And incidentally, you're catching the idea. But you're only protected for the idea in so far as it helps you make something, in so far as it has a practical application, not the idea itself. And as we said, right, that's a claim. My claim is, my invention is this new idea. And my claim is this idea is new and useful and therefore protectable because it helps me, whatever it is, make a drug, right? Then, two things in the patent applications I said, right? The thing, what it does. What it does bounds the scope of protection. And therefore, my idea, right, my way to make a drug is protected. But it's not protected as a way to make anything. It's not protected as a, a manufacturing process that someone is prevented from using in, say, making a car. The idea is only protected in so far as it is applied. So in my case, I can prevent someone else from using that process to make a drug, but not something else. And that's the difference. The idea, the process of making a drug is not protected in itself universally to prevent anyone from making anything with that manufacturing process. Instead, it is protected to make a drug. I can get a patent on that because it has an application. If it doesn't, I don't. And as a consequence of that, I can only prevent people from using it in that way. They can use it in another way, make something else, and that's allowed. Again, that might not be a separate characteristic. Because when something is just an abstract idea or theorem, it either is obvious to the posita, or it's too general, such that it is not useful, doesn't serve to make something not useful, not commercially useful, or it's so broad that it doesn't fall within the scope of patentable subject matter, which is, as we said, an invention which, as we'll see, has basically six permutations. So really, there's four things you need for a patent. And the book says you also need not to fall under the, the exclusion. That's really semantics. Because the exclusion is a rephrasing right, of what is not within the definition of either this, 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 or this, basically. So the other thing we said is that the policy consideration is very important like an intellectual property law. The consideration of balancing the rights the copyright owner to make money with the right of the public to access stuff without undue burden, generally in the form of someone who has a monopoly that can prevent them from accessing stuff and or charge for that. In patent law, the bargain is we want people to invent things and Right? Not just because that's a good thing in itself, but because it allows us to know about it, use it. For the first 20 years, it allows us to buy it from the inventor only, and after that it allows anyone to produce the same thing and make it better. And that drives society forward, so it's something we want to do. And therefore, to incentivize that, we give you a 20-year commercial monopoly over the idea. So. Patent law, even more than other areas of intellectual property law, is predicated upon this policy you know, weighing, this policy balance 
of, right, to give you a commercial monopoly in exchange for disclosure. And the reason we give it to you is so you disclose your stuff. So we'll still be in the first part of the analysis here of the four things you need, right? First thing you need is patentable subject matter. What is that? As we said, it's in section two of the act and it's what we call an invention. What's an invention, right? There, there are six things that you're given in the book, right? The first one, as we see, is, is, is we saw earlier, is a composition of matter. And as we said, it's very broad, right? Composition of matter. We saw that either in the first or the second capsule, in both actually. Second is a manufacturer. We looked at it very briefly and we said, right, a way to take a raw thing and turn it into a final product, basically. It means what it says and there isn't much more detail in the book. And again, if these things are confusing or too summary, don't panic. It just means that you're responsible for what we're learning. If we don't learn more, you don't have to know more. And if you think more is confusing, it's because we haven't looked at it and that's fine. It's not going to be covered on the exam or anything else. So, composition matter manufacturer, we will see four more here, four more ways that something is an invention and therefore patentable subject matter under the first criterion of the test for you to get a patent. So what are they, right? The third is a machine. What's a machine, right? Basically, that you're not given any example, so again, just having a summary indication of what it is is fine. And also, obviously, right, if you, if you think that these things are overlapping in some right. the court also thinks they're overlapping. So one thing can be categorized as more than one of these six. Basically, right, a machine is like the steam engine, like the, 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 the engine in a car. It's a machine that does something as opposed to under manufacturer makes something. It's a machine, you know, like the engine of a car. And you're told in the Amazon case, which we're going to look at in great detail, that Amazon was claiming that they had a machine, that they had a group of things that did something and that was new and therefore worthy of protection under the act. And the problem in Amazon, right, was that, as we'll see, for the patent examiner, so there's a bunch of stages, so the patent examiner looks at it, then the federal court, then the federal court of appeal, what you're reading is the federal court of appeal, it's the last level of this whole debate. For the patent examiner, the first instance decision maker, the problem was that the machine that Amazon was claiming was not independent. It did not work on its own. It's what, it was a one-click ordering system, as you'll recall. And the problem for the patent examiner was that it didn't work on its own. It only worked with the computer of the user. And the computer of the user isn't part of the system. It's not owned by Amazon. And therefore, that was a problem because the, the, court said, the, the, the examiner sorry, said it's not an independent machine. And as we'll see, eventually the court reverses that and says it's okay if something else participates in it. The other example you're given, uh, or which I'll give, is an iPad, right? Or they say a computer. Obviously, a computer, if you invent the idea of a new computer, a way to put the parts together, that is a machine. And that's something that you can get a patent on because it's something that you've invented that's protected. Obviously, you don't own the constituent parts. And because you don't own them and you haven't invented them, you do not have a patent on that. You just have a patent on the way to use a bunch of things together in a way that you can make whatever you're getting a patent on. It doesn't mean that you can prevent people from using the microchip. And it doesn't mean, right, that you can say, well, Intel won't sell me a microchip. This is outrageous. I can't exercise my patent. It doesn't matter because you don't have a right to buy it 
because you don't have a right to it at all. You just have a right to be the only person who can use it along with all the other parts in the computer to make the computer, the specific type of thing you're getting a patent on. And of course, as we'll see, that can be an impediment to innovation. Because if these things below are patented, say by your competitor, you might have a problem, right? Your competitor might prevent you from using it, one of the constituent parts, such that you're unable to make a computer. And that's bad for innovation because people come up with new things, they come up with more and more complex things by using other people's stuff, including stuff that is patented, and they do it legitimately by paying the patent holder. If the patent holder can prevent you from doing that by virtue of their monopoly, that's bad for innovation. Fourth thing under the definition of an invention is an art. What's an art? Well, it's an art like the person reasonably skilled in the arts. An art is the state of knowledge in a, a specific field. Like we say, a state-of-the-art machine. What, what is a state-of-the-art machine? It's a machine that builds upon the very best and newest ideas in the field of whatever the machine's about, right? Surgery or, or drugs or drug making, right? An art is that. And so if you come up with a new way to use something, and again, operative thing here is use, right? The way is not patentable unless it has a use. If you come up with a new way to use something, to use a molecule as a drug to cure something, as we said earlier, that's an art. So what you do is you advance the knowledge in a field, and quite often you do it by using something people already know about, like a molecule, and as a result of people knowing about it, as a result of it being either obvious or patented by somebody else, or formerly patented by somebody else and now in the public domain such that it's not patentable, you use that to come up with your new method, then obviously, again, for the same reasons I've just enunciated, we don't, you don't have a right on the thing, the underlying thing that you haven't invented because you haven't invented it. So you don't have a right over the molecule, you just have a right over making the molecule into a pill that cures cancer. That is your whole claim, and that's the only thing that you have protection on. That's an art. And the court gives you a description that might or might not be more helpful than the one I've just given it to you, right? An art is an act or series of acts performed by some physical agent upon some physical object. We'll see that the physical part is no longer valid after Amazon, after the Amazon case such that the object changes character or condition and, as I said, important part, it is con concrete in that in it consists in the application of agents to objects and then with to some tangible object or instrument. In other words, it has to be useful. It has to have a specific use and or application. So, What happens in the Amazon case? Again, right, so we'll put, by the way, the, the, the other two here, just so, you know, it's easier for you to understand later on where we are in the, in the conceptual tree, but um, the other two that we're going to look at are a process and an improvement. The Amazon case, what happened, right? Well, you had the patent examiner. Then the patent examiner, Amazon, right, has this one-click button, and that's new. We'll see why. Come up with it, 2010, right? It's not yesterday, it's 2010. Come up with it, tries to get a patent on it. Trying to claim, again, has to meet those various conditions I've hammered too many times already has to be an invention, one of these six things. Amazon is going to claim that it's more than one of these six things, which are independently things that are patentable. 
It's a machine, it's an art, and it's process. So, patent examiner, right, that's how it works. As we said, you apply, then the government looks at it. Who's the government? The government's a patent examiner. It's someone that has specific training to look into whether what you're claiming meets the conditions under the act. Patent examiner says no. Amazon's very mad, right? Because Amazon's going to make a lot of money by being the only people who can have that button. What does Amazon do, right? It avails itself, as we said, of this right that it has, like everyone under the Patents Act and the Federal Courts Act, to go to the federal court. And then, at the federal court, right, you don't read that judgment, but you, it's referred to many, many times, right? At the federal court, I think it's Justice um, Phelan, I'll just, yeah, it is. So, right, Justice Phelan looks at it, basically says, yes, the patent examiner got it wrong for reasons that are very specific then goes up to the Federal Court of Appeal. And then what does the Federal Court of Appeal say? And again, that's the judgment you're reading. The only decision you're reading is the Federal Court of Appeal, but it refers to the lower court, the lower instance decision makers, such that it's helpful for you to understand how this proceeded, especially since they all found different things that are somewhat confusing. And again, you don't have to understand this in great depth. Whatever I'm saying is probably a bit more than what's important. And everything else that's in the case is not important for our purposes. Federal Court of Appeal. What does Federal Court of Appeal say? Federal Court of Appeal says yes, but for different reasons, as we'll see. And that's where it gets confusing. So what happens to the one-click button, right? Well, Justice Phelan says at the federal court, Justice Phelan says, right, the problem is that it's not a physical object. So we're in the art thing, right? The art, as we said, has to have a practical application. And as defined in prior cases, it had to have an application on a physical object. So one of the things Justice Phelan says, Justice Phelan is going to say, yes, you get your patent, but that doesn't mean that you meet the three or four things that you said you are. Justice Phelan says it's not an art. Why is that? It's not this. It can be other things. In Amazon being smart, they claimed it's more than one. It's not an art. Why is that? Because an art has to have an application. In prior cases said an application has to be physical. So an art has to have a physical application. And so, Amazon, you're not, right? Then, on appeal, Federal Court of Appeal says, no, this is not correct. There's no need for a physical application. So you can have an art or a process that's supplied within a computer, doesn't yield a physical thing, doesn't change a physical thing, that's fine. Federal Court of Appeal says, justice feeling, you got it wrong. That's at paragraph 49, right, page 652. It says, includes the change of character or condition in a physical object. The commissioner had said that. Sorry, I might have made a mistake there. The commissioner and I think Justice Phelan said that it has to have a physical, um, an impact on a physical thing. Regardless, the important thing is, the Federal Court of Appeal says this is not a requirement. This is not correct. And they review the, the principles that are applicable. I grant them paragraph 50. And they say, right, it has to be a concrete application in, in, in used in connection with some tangible object or instrument. And, you, and they say basically what I said earlier, I hopefully more clearly than they do, right? That you're, you can be protected on the idea, even though the idea is not protected, right? Not protected here or here, right? You can get a patent on the idea, but only insofar as it's applied. And that limits the scope of your protection. 
And the court says, right, what, are the what is the test, paragraph 50 again, for, right, what is a, um, what is um, an art, right? And the court says, has to be new, has to be, you know, not an abstract idea, but something that has an application, as I said. And, right, it has to be something that has what they call a commercially useful result. And that's an application, again, of that useful criterion, which always applies. But they apply it in the definition, for the reason I just said, for the definition of an art, to emphasize this idea, right, that your idea is not protected. That it's only protected when it has an application, and the court goes further, right. I already said that these things need to be commercial somewhat. But the court goes further, says it very explicitly, they say, an art is an idea that has a commercially useful application. That's basically um, what I said earlier. And then you have a process. What is a process, right? Essentially a similar thing, right? A process is a way to make something. Instruction for instructions for making a drug. And is that protected? The answer is yes, it can be. And again, you don't have to have a greater understanding of the six things because we don't look at them in greater detail. And as I said, they are overlapping. So what is it, right? It's a way to make something. And that gets us back to this exclusion of ideas not being protected. And where do you draw the line between a patent that you cannot have on a way to make something and then a way to make something that is specific enough, that has a consequence in making something, in making you know, something that is commercially useful, that is a, a resulting thing, such that the idea is protected in so far it helps you make the thing. And basically the court says that the line is drawn in the same place. And the court talks about this exclusion for business methods. Initially, this thing that I said where ideas are not protected used to be called a business method exclusion. What's a business method? Really, no one knows, but it's very broad. It's anything in your company. Right? You have a way to manage your, your HR department. You have a way to run your factory line. Not a way to make something new that is unique, just a way to run your factory line. And obviously, these very big companies that have a lot of money are smart. And they will try to go to court, to, to the government, sorry, try to get a patent on how they run their factory. Why is that? Because a patent is like a nuclear bomb. Then, right, they'll be the only ones who can use that method of making, you know, that method of running a factory for 20 years. And that's great, because then they can go into their competitors and say, you can't do that, and it'll be for them a competitive advantage. But that's where it gets so general, a way to run a factory, so general that it doesn't count under what you can get a patent on. But the court is very careful to say that that doesn't mean that there's a business method exclusion. Because in fact, a business method is a way to run something, right? But as we said, same thing as an idea, when it's specific enough, it can be protected. If your business method is a way to run a factory line that helps you make, you know, something that no one's ever made and you invented the way to make it, then that's protected. The new thing is protected as an invention, as a composition matter. But the way to make it is protected as well as, as either one of these things or many. And you can get protection on that. And because a business method is so broad and a word that doesn't really have you know, a solid meaning, especially in Canada, the court says there's no business method exclusion. Because when a business method is specific enough, when a business method is a way to make something, again, concrete application, it can be protected. Again, this is really not clear to anyone, including the court, but hopefully I've made it as clear as it can be 
And what I said is as much as you need to know. And you don't have, again, to go crazy over the distinction between these various things. And so, again, on appeal, right, the Federal Court of Appeal disagrees with the physical requirement. So it has to be something that has a concrete application, right? But that concrete application doesn't mean that you have to create a physical product. You can create a virtual product, for instance, within a computer or a website. So that's the definition of the thing as far as you're given. What about the Amazon case, right? What happens in the Amazon case, which we said here, goes through three levels of, um, of court. It goes through the examiner, federal court, federal court of appeal. At the federal court of appeal, that's where the law gets settled. It's the final decision maker. And they say what the other levels got wrong. And basically they say, yes, Amazon, your one-click thing can be the subject of a patent because the reasons given by the other two levels were not correct applications of these six things to the specific facts of the case. So what happened in Amazon, right? The background that you're given, page 655, in the first paragraphs of the case is helpful because you might think that a one-click ordering idea is pretty dumb, right? That it's pretty obvious and therefore that you know, it's, you shouldn't get a patent on it. But again, this is a long time ago, right? The case is 2011 at the Federal Court of Appeal, I think 2010 at the Federal Court, but it had been lingering in the system, in the patent system for much longer than that. So, you know, it might have been revolutionary then. And what happens, Amazon really did invent that. Amazon's created, right, 1998, right? And they, they come up with this thing where, where basically there's a problem and that is that consumers have too much friction when they're trying to buy something. And that's bad because that means a consumer might want to buy from you, but because you make it confusing or you make it too much trouble, they get sick of it and then make the decision not to buy. And one of the friction costs, right, was that when a consumer bought something and then wanted to order the same thing again, just you know, five minutes after, because they realized they want to, they had to re-enter all their information, their address, their shipping, their payment method, and all that. And that's friction. Consumer, right? That's more steps you're putting um, before the consumer. And that increases the likelihood that the consumer is going to get sick or is going to get confused and therefore won't buy from you. So having this innovation of the one-click button, the one-click buying button was a great idea because what it did is it removed these unnecessary steps. It stored somewhere your address, you know, your, your, your payment method, and applied it automatically to your second purchase such that it, was be, it would be as quick and simple as possible. And it was revolutionary at the time in, in the early 2000s and arguably up until, you know, that went up to the Federal Court of Appeal. And of course, right, you have a bunch of problems. First, it's not physical, but then the Federal Court of Appeal says this is no longer a requirement. Second, right, is it an abstract idea? Is it under the exclusion? The answer is no, because it has a concrete application. It's not just, you know, a way to, you know, it's not just this abstract idea of, while well, you could put the information and add it automatically. It is, right? We have a way, we, we wrote code for this. We have a way that is new. No, one ha no one's made this code before to gather your information, put in a cookie, and then apply it to your next purchase. That is new. And, right, it's not clear what it is. It can be, you know, an art, a process, one of these things or both. And it has a concrete application. You're not trying to protect the cookie that stores the information for all purposes. You're only protecting it for one purpose, and that is to help a consumer buy something on the website. 
as a concrete application. And since it doesn't have to be a physical application, prima facie, it is protected. And that's what the court says. And again, just to clarify this one more time, right, the court says, right, a conclusion to the effect that something is not patentable subject matter. That gets confusing, right? Because these are all the same thing. If the court says it's not patentable subject matter, again, what this is is the first criterion. So what, is, what does it mean to not be patentable subject matter? Well, it doesn't fall within the definition of that at section two, which includes an invention. And an invention is one of those six things, basically. So what is not patentable subject matter? Well, not one of those six things. And that's what the court means when it uses the words interchangeably, right? It's not an invention. It's not quite one of these things because it doesn't meet the various criteria or it's not patentable subject matter. That's all the same thing because as I said many times, right? Probably too many times, you're still at the first step in the conceptual analysis. The first criterion, which is patentable subject matter. There's three or four others, depending on how you see it. We're still at the first. And so all of these you know, ways to put it essentially makes, mean the same thing. Paragraph 27, court in its analysis, when it starts its analysis, says what? Well, the court says, it always does in intellectual property cases. We must interpret these laws consistent with their broader policy objectives. And in our case, that is the bargain. So the first thing the court says, it tells you how important it is, right? First thing the court says in its analysis, paragraph 27 is, the whole thing here, the whole patent act is about protecting people's monopolies such that people create inventions and tell us about them. And the court says, right, we want to interpret it as that. We don't want to upset the balance. We don't want to give too much monopoly over too many things. And conversely, we don't want to erode that, these monopolies so much that they no longer achieve their purpose, which is get people to invent things. And, right, the court says that you have to interpret it according to that. And they get back as well to the concept we saw earlier of disclosure. Because again, one of the parts of it is disclosure. So we expect the inventor on their patent application to sufficiently and properly disclose. Disclose what? Well, as I said, the two things that are on your patent application, what it is, what it does. Basically, the invention and the claim. And you have to disclose these things enough. Interestingly, paragraph 28, the court cites, cites section 27 of the Patents Act, which is phrased interestingly, right? Court says, the, the section, sorry, says 27.1, the commissioner, that's the administrative person, right? So the examiner looks at it. The examiner works for the commissioner of patents. So the commissioner, the boss, the, the entity, shall grant a patent for an invention, blah, blah, blah. That meets the conditions. Shall. Shall, in the English language, in the, in the lawyer, um, in, in lawyerly language, is obligatory. Shall is the way to say must, not may, basically. And that's the magic word you put in your contracts to say that it's an obligation not an option, not something you may do, something you must do. How's the, the section phrase, section 27, one of the Patents Act? It says the commissioner shall grant an invention. So what does that mean? It means there's no discretion. And that's important because it makes the regime fair. Once you meet the conditions, the government doesn't sit around and say, well, do we like this guy or do we think this is a good invention? Or do we think this is a, a, an invention that no one's going to buy? Right? These are everything that's not in the analysis. There's no discretion to consider them. Once you meet the conditions, you get a patent. Doesn't matter if you're you know, rude, rich, poor, whatever. 
at least on paper. And the court repeats, paragraph 31, the decision of the commissioner to grant or refuse a patent application is not a matter of discretion. As I said, once you meet the conditions, the commissioner has to give you a patent. And as a corollary of that, the commissioner cannot consider various other things that it likes or doesn't like because it's not what the test says. That's not what the criteria say. And quite importantly, right, the commissioner only looks at these things, whether it is it meets the conditions, whether it's one of these things, whether it's novel, useful, and non-obvious to the posita. One of the things that the government doesn't look at is whether the underlying idea is true. So again, the government only looks at whether your plan makes sense and should yield a snowmobile, and whether it makes sense with the explanations, you're give, you, the explanations you give the government that your snowmobile does what it does, you know, works on snow. The government does not try to build it to see if that's true and doesn't try it on snow to see if that's true. Quite importantly though, as the court says, it's not something the commissioner is prevented from doing. It's not an exclusion. So if the commissioner wants to look into it, they're allowed. But systematically, they look at whether you meet the conditions and they look at everything except one thing that's pretty important and that is, right, whether it actually works. As we'll see, and there's lots of exceptions and nuances, but generally government doesn't look at it, doesn't look at that. And the court repeats a bunch of things that I've said already in the first capsule. You know, you get references, but just repeating the same things I've said. Paragraph 20, uh, sorry, 37, the court says, the scope of the claim bounds the scope of the patent. You're only protected for what you say your thing does, not for anything else the thing may or may not do. The court says it very explicitly. Paragraph 38 is where the court says explicitly that, that, that the government only looks at these four or five things. So whether it's the four things and whether it's, it falls within the exclusion for abstract principles or ideas. Paragraph 42 is where the court says what I said earlier, that the commissioner is not prevented from seeing what the inventor has actually invented or what the inventor claims to have invented. On the contrary, these things are relevant to the four characteristics, and insofar as they are, the government has to look into them. And the government can look at them independently if it feels it's necessary, and there's no prohibition on that. And one of the things, right, that gets pretty close to this, to, to the government doing this, and again, this is not super important, as long as you get the broad strokes, you're good. One of the other things the government says at paragraph 44 right, is that often um, there is going to be, there's, there's going to be, right, someone claiming that their thing is one of those, for a reason or another, that is not true. And you do look, look into that as the government. You don't, you don't just look at whether, you know, the thing is a machine. You have to look at whether you know, the, the, the patent uh, applicant carefully used words to say this is an art or a process, but really in actuality that's a lie. It's just a broad theorem or idea that's not protected. In other words, as I said, it doesn't have a, a practical application. So that's one of the ways in which, right, the government goes beyond what's written down and kind of analyzes the details of it to see what the, the, the patent applicant has actually done. Or in other words, whether what they're describing as an invention is, you know, something that warrants the use of the word they're using, or if it's really something else and they use one of the magic words because they want to, you know, 
mischievously get a patent on something that is not otherwise patentable subject matter. And paragraph 52 to 54 are important because they tell you, they repeat what I said. And why is it, right, that we don't say that there is a need for a physical thing? Why is it that we don't have a broad rule that says business methods are excluded? And the reason is because by definition, right, again, paragraphs 52 and following, and paragraph 60, the reason we don't say has to be physical or has not to be a business method is because, right, that's the purpose of patents. Patents are for people to invent things, and by definition, when they invent things, they're new and non-obvious, and therefore, no one had thought of them when they wrote down the Patents Act, right? Otherwise, they would be not new and obvious. And therefore, to have strict things like that, to have, for instance, a physical requirement, doesn't let us evolve as a society to a place where computers and everything happens virtually. Or, right, trying to say you can't pro protect a way to run your, your, your manufacturing department. Well, if we have a broad exclusion like that, it detracts from the, broad, from the real rule, which is that it has to have an application. And so, Generally, you cannot patent a way to run your manufacturing department. But if you come up with a way to run a, an assembly line, and that's a new way and the only way to, to, to make something, then it's protected because it has a practical application. And the court says, right, very importantly, that the principles have to be broad. And we don't have to stick too closely to phrases or ideas because these concepts need to be given the space they need to cover things that we, by definition, have not yet thought about. And the court also says that to think of things like, um, like, um, like, like saying has to have a physical application detracts from the criteria. And there is no physical thing in what I said so far. And therefore, to, to add new criteria, to say, right, the court decided this in this case, and it must mean that we can never protect physical things because the court said so in a specific case. That's wrong because it detracts from the real rules, which are purposely broad, and from the fact, analogously, that every patent application turns on its own facts. Every patent application, right, you have to look at the thing on its own not by referring over, overly referring to other cases or how other patents were ruled, were decide, patent applications were decided. But you have to look at the principles that apply to the case, to the specific case, as construed, right, as an independent set of facts. And essentially, right, the, the court by saying this says that's one of the things that and Justice Phelan, the two decision makers below the Federal Court of Appeal, got wrong. And in fact, that's the nuance between what Justice Phelan did. Because the patent examiner said no. The patent examiner said no Amazon, right? You don't need those characteristics, which eventually, mostly, the Federal Court of Appeal says don't exist, are not conditions. And therefore, you can get your patent to Amazon most likely. Then Justice Phelan says, yes, you can get your patent, but only on because you're some of these things. And why are you not the other things, right, that you claim to be? That's because there's additional requirements. And the Federal Court of Appeal says, right, some of these requirements, especially the physicality requirements, do not exist, are not real requirements. And so that's the nuance, right? The Federal Court of Appeal says something different. Federal Court of Appeal lays out the principles for patent law differently, but the end result is the same. The end result is, yes, not yes, Amazon, you get your patent, but yes, Amazon, you may get your patent because the examiner, the reasons they, he said that you should not get it are wrong. 
What happens ultimately, and this is not important, right? What's important is what I've said so far. What happens ultimately is the Federal Court of Appeal sends it back to the examiner. It says, read what we said, right? Read what we said as to how to apply it, and then re-examine the facts properly. And most likely the end result, given what the court said, is that Amazon's going to get its patent, but for a lot of reasons which are very interesting, but which we won't get into, the federal court has to respect the fact that it's not an expert in either patents or administrative, or, or administrative decision making as applied to patents, right? The examiner is. The examiner is the one that looks at that all day, not the federal court of appeal. And the government said, right, your patents applications are adjudicated by the examiner for a reason. And the reason is because we want someone who knows about it. And so, again, this is not important. The court's job on review of this is to look at whether the decision was reasonable. It's not to do it over. And so the Federal Court of Appeal didn't have the experts to say, you know, how it will work because these experts were, you know, either here or not there at all. Because that's not their job. Their job is to say whether the examiner made a mistake in the law, in the principles and in applying them. It is not to, to say, right, ultimately what the end result should be in. So the court says, right, the examiner got it wrong. The examiner got the law wrong. That's the law, and then by, by virtue of respect for the decision maker, not particularly important again, the, the Federal Court of Appeal sends it back and says, see, right, we gave you the law, we corrected your mistakes, read this, make your decision on the Amazon patent. Sixth category, the process, right, Amazon claimed to be processed as well, Amazon one click button claimed to be processed. Sixth category, which we don't look at in great detail, is improvement thereupon. Improvement on what? On something else. And I gave you that example already, right? What if you have an iPad that incorporates component parts, including some that are patented? Well, you're not protected for those because they're not yours. You didn't invent them. Same is true for a patented invention. If there's a, what they, they, they describe as a three-legged chair, right? And then you realize that, you know, someone invented that, right? That's great. So backing up a bit. Someone invented it and it's great because now people can sit, right? Then you look at this and you're like, wow, tremendous thing, right? But if we put a fourth leg on it, it's even better, right? Because it, ostensibly, because it doesn't fall, right? And, and, right, you invent that. Well, you can do that. And you can do that while... The other thing is still patented, but you won't have a right on the three-legged chair. You'll only have a right, a patent, on the improvement. And that's allowed, even if the underlying thing is patented. But of course, as we said, you'll have to have permission from the patent holder, typically by paying them money. 